Hey everybody, my name is John Stoltz and I work on the Android Systems team. Um, I'm going to talk about proxy execution. So of course, I've got to say thank you to all the folks who have worked on this before. Um, you know, it's the shoulders I get to stand on. I'm sorry I've been gaining weight. Um, but uh, one of the issues I've had is as I've given talks at OSPM and other things, because there's been so many talks about proxy execution at other conferences, um, I've kind of assumed that it was, I guess, better well known. Um, as I've kind of gone through those ideas. So after my talk, sometimes I get a lot of curious confusion or, or interesting looks. Um, so I wanted to try to go through uh, some of this in a little more detail, kind of moving through it to an overview of the, both the ideas and the code. Um, I've got way more slides than I can get through, so I'm just going to kind of increase the complexity to the point where people want to ask questions and interrupt, and at that point it'll probably be over. Um, so quick background. So on Android, we've got foreground and background tasks. We've got a whole bunch of other categories as well, but just to simplify. Um, and you know, these tasks, for the most part, run as SCED fair, or SCED normal. Um, and so that means that they're going, you know, as we have more background tasks, we kind of have proportionally less CPU time for the foreground task. Um, and, you know, the foreground task is the more important one, so we want to find ways to prevent the background tasks from uh, impacting that foreground task. Um, so the, you know, kind of straightforward answer would be, well, let's use C groups, so we use both CPU sets to restrict the CPUs um, that the background task can run on. And then, you know, we could also try to use uh, the CPU shares to further uh, restrict the amount of time that they, those tasks could get on the CPUs. Um, but this pretty quickly runs into trouble. Um, if you look over here, we've got kind of a test that does some simple file system operations. Um, and when we uh, try to uh, basically restrict some background tasks doing those same file system operations, the average for the foreground task gets better, but we start to see these really big outliers blow up. And this is just classic priority inversion. Um, and this is an example on an Android device of just kind of launching the calculator. You can have, you know, just the baseline, just launching alone. Uh, if we add some CPU spinners, obviously the performance gets worse. If we bound the CPU spinners to the background C groups, we're back down to the normal case. But if any of those uh, background C groups start calling into the kernel and grabbing some locks inside the kernel, uh, it just blows up. Um, so not ideal. Um, this is kind of the canonical example of, of priority uh, inversion in the real-time world. Um, I think everybody's probably familiar with that. The kind of normal solution for this is to use priority inheritance. Um, and so the idea is we want to have something like priority inheritance, but we want something that can apply to SCED normal tasks where we don't have a strict linear priority order because we have to deal with, you know, the various C groups and the V run times of each individual task. It's hard to figure out, you know, what, what we should actually inherit there. Um, so we're kind of going to use two tricks to, to make this work. And the first is we're going to leave the mutex block tasks on the run queue. So this is sort of like the opposite of the preempt RT patch set where we're making mutexes spin locks. Um, and so they're just going to spin. Um, but then what we're going to do is we're going to use the picnic task function in, in the kernel to pick the most important task to run. So we're kind of going to let it be the black box of deciding what's the most important task. If that task is a RT or is a, um, a mutex block task, we're then going to, instead of running it, because that would just spin and waste time, we're going to go through and traverse kind of, you know, which task or which mutex it's blocked on, and then we're going to find the owner for that and run that instead. So we're kind of running this uh, lock owner on behalf of the task that we think is most important to run. Um, there's kind of this simplified example of the code and schedule. Uh, where, again, it's just pick next task, we check to see if the task is blocked, and then we find a proxy task to run instead. Um, Problem solved? Pardon? Problem, Problem solved. Yeah, very simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with this, uh, you know, so again, at the top here, we have the previous uh, chart. Um, with proxy execution, when we do that, it does exactly what we want, where we're kind of constraining uh, the background tasks, the foreground tasks don't get interrupted. It looks really nice, just, you know, attractive stuff. Um, with uh, the Android example, um, again, it, some of this is worse. I'm using the worst case values, so some of the variance there is, uh, I guess, just part of the test. Um, but you know, again, with the uh, outlier here, when we when we get the mutex contention, uh, we're able to stay down in the baseline space with the proxy execution. So it's it's uh, something we're excited about. Um, so in order to do this, we kind of have to have this idea of having kind of dual context, because not only do we have just the task that's running, but we also have the task that we are running kind of on behalf of. 
Um, and so this selected task that we think is the most important task to run, we're going to call the, the donor. And we keep track of it in the run queue within the donor pointer. Um, uh, so this is the task that if it's mutex blocks, it's not actually going to run. Um, and it, sometimes we'll call it the, uh, the, the scheduler context or the, uh, the waiter um, or the donor task. Um, and then basically when we go through and try to find the task that we are going to run on its behalf, that's going to be basically the current task. Um, and uh, you know, this will call often the execution context or the uh, lock owner or the proxy task. Um, and basically, this is what we're going to run on behalf of the donor if uh, uh, the donor is mutex locked. Now, these both can point to the same task. If you don't have a task that's not uh, uh, mutex blocked, it's just kind of they're, they're the same, and we just kind of carry forward. Um, so that um, I've also kind of sprinkled links, so hopefully the slides are helpful to kind of go look at later and, and uh, uh, look at the actual code. Um, so another aspect that kind of adds some complexity to this is that we're dealing with the fact that mutex is nest, and so you can end up with this aspect of tasks that are blocked on mutex that are owned by uh, tasks that are waiting on other mutexes, and so it can become these long chains. Um, and one particularly difficult part is that we have this kind of alternating of types that we're kind of moving through as we go through this. And so this makes the locking extra complicated because we have to have a strict locking order, um, which we have over here. Uh, no, well, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, you have a locking order, but actually, um, I was just telling people when at the very, very beginning, when I first, first to get rid of the global PI lock, it mm -hmm. was because I wrote a proof from if the PI lock or the task lock, the PI lock and the locks lock, whatever, I don't know if the R, but the RQ lock will be a problem maybe. But if I said if the order of the locks themselves do not deadlock, then you can actually rotate through those lock owners in a specific way, and you're guaranteed not to deadlock as well. I don't yeah. use that at all. Um, so in this case, I mean, so potentially I know, you know, just getting past locked up with that might be a little complicated. Yeah, but that's, that's it's, the it's, thing is locked up doesn't know about it. And I, yeah. and I know uh, Thomas does tricks with the current code. Yeah. <laughs> in the um, inheritance. And so, one of the things is that allows this to work is because we have to kind of let go of the locks as we move to the next uh, step to preserve the locking order, is the fact that you know these tasks are on as long as they're on the same run queue that kind of isolates them and keeps them from disappearing on us, because we hold the run queue lock as we kind of iterate through this we know that okay those tasks aren't going to disappear and so since the tasks are blocked on the mutex the mutexes aren't going to disappear, this only gets us as far as one step off the run queue. So when we look at one, ta we can kind of look at one task that's not on our CPU to be able to assess things. Um, but that's kind of the limit of it. So we can't kind of zigzag across CPUs as, as we are looking at these chains. So let's go through some simple proxying. We're going to just assume we're just working with one CPU. Um, and so in this case, uh, the first bit of change that we have is just basically the logic to keep the, the mutex block tasks on the run queue. We've kind of uh, change the logic that deactivates the task into this helper, and we pass in the simple task as block. So this isn't super uh, interesting, but it's kind of straightforward there. Um, later on in schedule, um, this is what I call the pick again loop. Um, so we basically will go through, we pick the next task. Um, we'll then kind of, as I said before, we check to see if the task is blocked, and if it is, we'll call find proxy task. Now, if find proxy task can return a couple things. So if it returns null, that means you know, something has changed and we need to start over again. Um, so we will go through and call that balance callback, which basically undoes some state that was set in pick next task. Um, and then we can go back to pick again and start over. Um, if uh, next ends up being pointing to the idle task, that basically means that we want to do something with the current running task. And obviously, we can't do that while it's still running. So we need to quickly switch to idle and then we'll come back in, and so we preserve the resched so that after that happens, we can come back in and, and, and do what we need. Um, when we look into that find proxy task, uh, this is basically the logic that does that chain walking that I was talking about earlier. Um, so again, we start with kind of that uh, donor task that was uh, provided, and then we uh, will kind of iterate through as long as the task is blocked, um, moving on to the next owner, basically each iteration. Um, you know, Basically, we could find the mutex that we need, we grab the locks, we revalidate things, um, 
and then basically find the mutex owner, then there's a bunch of complicated logic that I'll dive into as we get into it. Um, but we kind of traverse this along until we come to the uh, unblocked owner, and then we return that. Um, okay, so now we get to the next step as it's kind of getting a little more complicated, and we're gonna start dealing with the fact when we have multiple CPUs. Um, so one of the aspects that we have is if we pick a task and it's the owner, so that it's uh, the mutex that it's blocked on is actually on a different CPU. Um, we kind of, you know, I guess there's two options here because either we could move that owning task to our CPU and run it there, or we could move to, you know, the, the owner's CPU and try to boost it there. Um, the problem is, is that that task that we're trying to boost may be CPU find, a CPU find so that it can't run on our CPU. Um, and since the block task isn't going to actually run, we can migrate it and use it for the selection process to boost it, um, to boost the lock owner. Um, and so that's basically what we'll end up doing. Um, and so in this case, we migrate it over to the other run queue and then it basically is used for selection and then they can boost and, and run the uh, lock owner. Now we do have to be careful because at some point that owner is gonna let go of the lock. And at that point, the task is no longer blocked, but we can't run it on the CPU. So we have to do what I'm called return migration before we, we get that task to a runnable state. Um, so I'll cover that in a little bit later. But uh, uh, just for initially dealing with that first migration, um, when we're in that uh, find proxy task loop again, um, so this is in that complicated chunk of code I mentioned earlier. Um, so we'll find the task owner if you know it's not on the CPU. Uh, we basically let go of the, the block lock and the mutex locked, and then basically call, you know, this is the check if the current's in the chain, so if we're trying to migrate current, we can't do that until it's uh, not running, uh, and so we'll go to return idle instead for that cycle. Um, and then we basically call proxy migrate task. Um, in proxy migrate task, uh, we have to do some cleanup initially for some of the state that we've set. Um, then we kind of iterate through. This part's a little interesting because we basically walk backwards through the chain, adding yeah. each task. Go Real quick, just, uh, sure. just so I understand, just uh, go back one of uh, the current in the chain. Yeah. That's something. So is that, is that because it's in the process of being blocked or something? It's, that's why it's running? Well, so or? yeah, so if, if the task is running and we're trying to kind of go through and say, okay, well, what are we gonna run next? And if in that chain, is the current task. Like, we can't migrate that. We can't do any operations on the current task while it's running. Well, I'm saying, because it's always, that's what I'm saying, because ideally it's blocked, because otherwise it wouldn't be in the chain if it wasn't blocked. But I, that's the point I'm saying. It's in the process of either being going to, or being going off, or is it in the process it of coming? It may not be, because we may have done something where we've uh, been running an important task that just wasn't blocked, and then it's done. And so we pick the next task to run. And that task is a mutex block task that then needs a, a lower priority. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, so I'm, okay, I'm confused with the current in the chain. That's what I'm saying. Okay. How does current in the chain happen? Like how is current, like the, the current is a running task. Yeah. And so if the current task is suddenly blocked. Wait. What? So. Here, here, here. Ready? Um. So even if current is blocked or should be blocked, um, it is on the CPU until you've context switched to whatever task is next. Yeah, that was basically my question. It's either in the process of being blocked or coming out of being blocked. That's the only time it current is in the chain. I mean, like I said, you're blocked. You're, you're on the CPU because you're about to say, OK, I got to figure out things and go to sleep. So is that probably so yeah. basically it's a transitional phase. Yeah, but okay. you need to deal with it. Yeah, but I'm saying is that that was never clear. That's why I was asking. That. If you just said Apologies. it's a transitional fit, I mean, okay. just for our ticket. Yeah, it makes more sense. All right. Um, so what we do is we kind of walk backwards up the chain uh, to basically dequeue each task <laughs> in that migration, or deactivate, I'm sorry. Um, and then basically we will set the task to the target CPU. Um, as we do that, we do the zap callbacks again to kind of clear that state uh, that we were uh, set in a uh, pick next task. Um, then we basically let go of the run queue lock. This is scary. <laughs> and so at that point, we grab the target's run queue, run through that list and queuing things um, or activating them, and then uh, switch back to grabbing that uh, run queue. Now, because we've let go of the run queue lock, you know, danger, things are not possibly what we expect. 
Um, but we're going to return null from this and start over at that top of the pick again loop. So there's no kind of existing state that we have to worry about. Um, so it's, it's a little messy, but it, it's there. So now we get on to the return migration. Um, this needs a little extra state because we need to have kind of a sense that you know, if the task is runnable or if it's blocked on a mutex, and then we also need to kind of have a third state, which is this waking, um, just so that we make sure that we don't accidentally run it as soon as the, the lock owner lets go. Um, I kind of feel like this should be able to be integrated into the task state because there's some overlap in kind of conceptual ideas, but I haven't been super confident on how to quite do that right. So I, right now I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it separate. Um, in try to wake up, when we get a wake up um, on one of these block tasks, um, the first thing that we check is kind of if the state matches what we expect it to be, and if it doesn't, usually we'll break out and just say, oh, you know, it's already been woken up in some way, so we're, we're, we're done. Um, but what we're gonna do is add some extra checks to make sure if it is running or running and it's uh, in the waking state, then at that point we need to not break at this point and we're gonna continue on. Um, down here we're gonna check uh, if we're on the run queue, which of course we are if we're a mutex blocked uh, task. And then we call into TT, uh, TT, TTWU uh, runnable. Um, and in that runnable case, we're basically going to add a little, we've added a little bit of logic to check if the proxy needs are sked. And if that is the case, we skip the do wake up. Um, in that proxy needs return, again, we're checking to make sure that the task is uh, waking or in that waking state. Um, and if it's the CPU that we're currently on is not the wake CPU, which was preserved when we did the initial migration. Um, and if that's the case, then we basically deactivate the task and we return true. So at this point, it's off the run queue. Um, and then we'll set it as runnable. And then we'll kind of fall back down through the rest of the try to wake up logic, where we call just as normally tasks do the select task run queue. And that will basically set it up to run on the uh, proper uh, run queue. And so it's, that's kind of the point where we're returning it back on that wake up. So again, it's, it's com complicated and messy. Yeah, but I, real, I was about to say real quick, just, what's the overhead? Um, I mean, so this is one of those things where I think we, there is some extra overhead, especially in the trying to grab the run queue locks yeah. multiple times through going through this. Um, a lot of it also comes into the, uh, you know, we try to be good about when we do that, we do the whole chain at once. Um, so we're not kind of iterating through each step. Um, but it's, it's, you know, there's some overhead. It's not zero, but uh, has maybe a silly question. So do you do the migrate return even if the, the tasks that should return is fine with the current CPU in its affinity mask? I'm sorry, say that again? If, if the task to be migrated back is actually fine with staying uh, with the current CPU, so, do you still migrate? Why don't so you leave it? I still do the return is? migration, and part of that is is because with uh, you know the scheduler decisions that happen before we hit that blocked on state, tried to place that task on a CPU that it was most suitable to run. Yeah, I, and so if we migrate it off, and then it gets it running on a, like a little CPU at that but point. Only, only that. Uh, meanwhile, anything can can already be changed like in the, in the other CPUs. So yeah. like a scheduling decision happened know, many seconds ago, maybe now it's a completely different situation, yeah. so maybe. Yeah. So I mean, so basically while it's, while it's in the proxy state on another CPU yeah. um, and load balancer triggers, yeah. what does it see? Does it see, like does it say, does it, is the, um, is the load balancing, because it's processed, like all the numbers are on its original CPU, does a load balancing notice that it moved over, or is it just? So it will it, see it, but the task is not migratable. Right. It's not no, on the migrate no, list. No, I'm saying is the fact that can the load, basically, do you, it looks like you confused the load, load balancer. So basically, like you said, it's not actually, we migrate it to allow the chain and everything to go up, mm -hmm. but, or for it to run, oh, maybe not. So how, ah, I'm trying to think, how's the math, math on that? So for load balancing, <laughs> If, it's, if the other one's running under its kind of context, mm -hmm. does the load balance, how does the load balancer work? Does it, if, so basically, if say things were building up on its original CPU and maybe it got picked to be, I mean, would the load balancer see it as one of the things queued on the original or, or is it completely invisible or is it completely off? It did it actually migrate? So on the CPU that it started on, yeah. it is 
been migrated. So that one will see it as not present at, during this time. Right. Um, it will seem to be present on the run queue. That right. It's so migrated too. However, it's not migratable, so it's not pushable. Right. So that that's, I think that's the problem, I think, is the fact that if the load balancer is doing its numbers or whatever balancing this, it's going to see it on this one. So if you put it back, maybe the load balancer already fixed everything. This is true. You push it back, and now you screwed everything now, up. Now, although the thing is, is that it doesn't just yeah. push it back. It says the select next or select task run queue. It provides that wake CPU as a, as a, a suggestion. Okay. And so basically, that's where we'd like it to go, but this can choose a different CPU. So I could say, oh, you're not fit. Yeah. Okay. And so, all right, so we got down to one minute. So if there's any other questions, I'm happy to do that rather than get into the next step. Question I'm, type, I'm interested in what type of workload motivated all that work. So, um, so I mean, on Android, we run into any case of trying to do that restriction of the, the background tasks so that they don't affect the foreground tasks and we just see really bad latency. So it basically means that those like CPU controller for CPU uh, C groups just isn't usable. Um, and so right now, you know, we still use CPU sets, but even with that, we don't restrict it very much. So it's like, we'll give the background four of the little CPUs mm -hmm. just to make sure there's enough space to run stuff so that we don't run into big problems. Um, no, I see, thanks. Yeah, skid idle is another thing that would be nice to use for this, but it's just impossible. Yep. So. Anyway, that's it. Thanks so much. Yep. Check the slides for more details. I appreciate it.